Can I invite you to turn in your Bible to John chapter 6, <clears throat> to the passage that uh, Hein read just a few moments ago. Uh, John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. It's the fourth sign that John speaks of, uh, the feeding of the multitude, the feeding of the, uh, the 5,000. In the uh, four Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nearly 40 miracles are recorded that Jesus performed. I think about 37 miracles are, are recorded. And we know, of course, of many other instances, we're told that crowds came to him, that on occasions that they brought the crowds to him and uh, all their, the sick were brought to him and he healed them all on, on occasions, we're told. So it's, it's just a representative of the miracles that he performed. And the reason why Jesus did the miracles was to display his glory as the Son of God. And John says, we've seen over past weeks so far in the series, that uh, towards the end of John's Gospel, John chapter 20, that we're told that these things are recorded, that you may believe, that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that through believing in him that you may have life in his name. Do you know, one of the common objections that people raise against Christianity is this. They say, well, <laughs> but, you know, come on, science disproves the Bible. Science disproves the Bible and uh, the miracles. People will often quote the miracles and say, well, how can you possibly believe in miracles according to modern science. And it sounds like a very reasonable objection uh, until you actually think a little bit more deeply about their objection. Some of you may have heard the story about the policeman who saw a drunk man on his hands and knees under a streetlight looking for something. And the policeman saw him and took pity on him and said, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my car keys. And so the policeman felt sorry for him and got down and, and was looking with him, helping him to look for his car keys. And uh, there they were under the street light. And uh, after about 10 minutes, finding nothing, the policeman turns to the drunk and says to him, are you sure that this is where you lost your keys? And he said, no, no. He said, I actually lost them over in the park. And he said, well, why don't you look there? He said, there's no street light there. I don't know whether you see the point, but when someone says that science disproves the miracles, the existence of miracles, it's really rather like a drunk person looking in the wrong place. The problem is, is that they're looking, when people raise the objection, how can you possibly believe in miracles if you believe in modern, if you, if you understand modern science? The problem is, is that they're looking for miracles within their closed system, which even at the very outset denies the very possibility of miracles. So they're not going to find them there, are they? In fact, they won't even believe, if they won't believe the existence of God, how can they expect to believe in miracles within their system? That's the real problem. And John is saying here that if we are truly, if we really are free thinkers, as we claim to be, if we are free thinkers and open-minded, then as we consider the recorded details of the miracles that the Lord Jesus performed, then nearly 40 miracles, then you have to conclude that they authenticate, at least they authenticate the claims of Jesus, and then you're left with the claims of Jesus, which you either have to conclude that he is mad, bad, or God, as C.S. Lewis said, either that he is a lunatic, a liar, or he is really Lord. Of these 40 miracles, we're told, that uh, only one, apart from the resurrection of Christ himself, only one of the miracles recorded in the Bible appears in all four Gospels. And that is this miracle that we've read about this morning, the feeding of the 5,000. And therefore, it must be of some special significance. I wonder why you think that is. What do we see here? Well, first of all, we see compassion. We see that in the, in the healing of the lame man in the previous 
uh, chapter, in chapter 5, that we were thinking about last week. Following that, there is a dispute with the Jewish leaders. And then chapter 6 says that the Lord Jesus heads north. We don't know how much time has elapsed between chapter 5, the healing of the, uh, the lame man at Bethesda Pools, and now the feeding of the 5,000. But we are told that he heads north to Galilee, and during that time, the other Gospels tell us that he sent out the Twelve on their mission, and they came back, they'd reported what had happened. It's been a time of intense ministry. Also, in that intervening period, before we get to this uh, feeding of the 5,000, we're told that the disciples of John the Baptist had told Jesus that John had been beheaded by Herod. And so for Jesus and his disciples, this is a time of personal grief at the death of John the Baptist. It is a time of weariness in ministry. It's a time of growing hostility following the opposition of the Jewish leaders in chapter 5. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus says to them in verse 31, chapter 5, verse uh, in, 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 chap in verse 31, we're told that Jesus says to them, come apart and rest a while. The Lord Jesus calls them to, to rest. Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. There were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in a boat by themselves. They're in need of rest. They're weary. They're tired. But instead of resting, they're faced with now more intense ministry. In fact, we read in verse, in verse 2 that a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. Verse 3, Jesus went up on a mountain and there sat with his disciples. And it was the Passover. It was the time of the Passover that was near. Do you know, I, I, I've been thinking recently a lot, of course, about the, the miracles of Christ. And it has come home to me afresh just how concerned the Lord Jesus is for the physical needs of his disciples and physical needs of those who are suffering and in pain, anxious and troubled. And it's a reminder, I think, and particularly, I think, during this past week, it's brought home to me afresh, how how much more willing the Lord is to deal with those problems and how much more ready we ought to be to plead for healing for those who suffer. Not that we can force his hand. He's sovereign. We're to love and trust him even when he chooses not to heal. But nevertheless, I think we are encouraged to pray for healing because of his love and compassion for us. He is, after all, is he not our heavenly father? And, and Jesus said that, if an earthly father, even with our fallen hearts, that we give good gifts to our children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask? Your heavenly father this morning, he knows the number of hairs on your head, which for some of us may be less, may be more. He knows how many hairs there are on your head. He stores up every tear that you shed in his bottle. He knows every thought that you have, Psalm 139, even from afar, because he cares for you. Your heavenly Father loves you. And the Lord Jesus said that he shows kindness and generosity to the righteous and to the unrighteous. He gives sunshine and rain to the just and to the unjust, even to those who blaspheme his name and even those who argue against his very existence. He shows his love and kindness, and he provides for them, and he blesses them, and he, he is good to them. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I certainly can't say that I'm consistently kind to everyone. Can you say that? Can you say that you're always kind to those who abuse your kindness, who use you for their own purposes, who simply ignore you? And yet, here is Jesus displaying the heart of our Heavenly Father with his compassion. So, I think in the very first instance, we see compassion here in this miracle. But secondly, we see unbelief. Having asked Philip where they can get bread to feed the vast multitude, Philip says, verse 7, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have even just a little to eat. It's around the time of the, the Passover. There would have been 
huge crowds traveling, traveling south to Jerusalem and traveling back from Jerusalem. And the Lord Jesus looks upon them and he sees them as tired and hungry, as like sheep. He's moved with compassion. They're like sheep having no shepherd, which I think is very significant, actually, in this miracle. He sees them as sheep having no shepherd. And we're reminded of the selfless, self-sacrificial love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives himself for the needs of others even when he's tired and when he's grieving the loss of John the Baptist, a dear friend. But the focus of John is not on the teaching, but on his actions. It's the end of the day. His people are tired and hungry. How is he going to feed 5,000 men? The commentators say probably if you think of, uh, if you double that in terms of numbers of women and uh, children as well, probably, who knows, 25,000 people. And Jesus asks Philip, verse 5, where can we buy bread for 25,000 people? Jesus knew the answer, but we're told that he asks Philip in order to test him. We'll come back to that. That too is significant. We'll come back to that in a few moments. But, you know, we sometimes, when we read this miracle, we sometimes assume that they're on the point of starvation. That unless Jesus feeds them, they're all going to die. I don't think that is the case. I think they'll miss a meal. I think they may be desperately hungry, but they're not going to die if they don't eat. But Jesus is concerned sufficiently for them to feed them because he is concerned about our practical everyday needs. He teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. You know, we mustn't be so super spiritual to think that somehow God is only really concerned about our souls and that he's not concerned about the needs of our bodies as well. But Jesus has come. He's the Son of God. These things are recorded that you may believe that he is the Son of God. He has come to reveal the Father to us. And so later on he can say to Philip, He that has seen me has seen the Father. And the heart of the Heavenly Father is such that he is concerned about our practical everyday needs. No matter how insignificant we think our concerns may be, they are not insignificant to our loving Heavenly Father. There are vast needs here. Twenty, about maybe 25,000 people. One, den one denarius is the equivalent of a, a daily wage, apparently, for a Roman soldier. So it's a good kind of... Uh, it's, a, it's a good average daily, daily wage. So 200 denarii is about seven months' wages. And even that, one, one person's wages for seven months is not enough to satisfy the hunger of 25,000 people. It's not enough to give them barely just a, a handful of food. And so Andrew says to Jesus... Well, there's a small boy here, and he has five barley loaves and two small fish. And you can almost sense the, the hopelessness in Andrew's voice as he says that. That's why I'm saying there's a sense of unbelief here. They're saying to themselves, this is an impossible situation. How does he think we're going to feed all these vast multitudes? Jesus is teaching them to trust him. He's testing What's in their hearts? They've not long returned from their mission. They've seen the Lord do amazing things, casting out demons, healing the sick. And now they're in a crisis, a new crisis. And once again, it's like they're back to square one in terms of trusting him. They're struggling with their own unbelief, even though they're with Jesus. And the Lord of glory, who spoke everything into existence, is with them right now. And yet they're at their wit's end, not knowing what to do. You know, it does remind me a little bit. You remember when Jesus was in the boat, we're told, and they crossed the Sea of Galilee? And they went across to the other side, the, the region of the Gadarenes, the eastern side of the lake, which was regarded, actually, as a Gentile area of, of, um, of idolatry and of, of un unbelief. And they were crossing the lake, do you remember? And we're told that Jesus was in the boat and he was tired. And he made a pillow and he lay down. And he really settled down for good sleep. That's the kind of image that is given to us. And then a storm arises and they wake Jesus up and say, Master, don't you care that we are drowning? And Jesus responds by saying to them, Where is your faith, O you 
of little faith. And then he spoke the word, of course, and, and it became calm. Jesus doesn't say to them, you have no faith. He's not calling them rank unbelievers. But he says to them, where is your faith in this situation? Where is it in this context? They were real believers. They did believe, but they failed to bring their faith to bear upon this crisis on the, on the Sea of Galilee. And now it seems it's the same thing here as they're faced with multitudes who are in need of food. And they're back to square one again. And it just seems to me that I, that is my experience. Is that not your experience? That the Lord amazingly helps you in circumstances and then you face a new situation and once again you're panicking. And you're not sure whether you're going to see your way through this crisis. I'm sure that we can all identify with these disciples, even as believers. It is possible to be consistently walking with the Lord. You know, I'm not saying that I'm not talking about somebody in a backslidden condition, but even as believers consistently walking with the Lord, knowing who he is, knowing what he can do, knowing what he's done in our lives, knowing that he's never failed us, and yet we face a new situation, and once again, we're panicking. And he says, but why don't you bring, essentially, why don't you bring God to bear upon this situation? Now, unbelief temporarily blinds us and we find ourselves thinking momentarily like non-Christians. It's almost as though for a moment we forget that we're trusting in Christ, our Lord Jesus, who calls into existence things which are not. You know, at times like this you have to stop and you have to speak to your own heart, don't you? You have to take stock and remind yourself who your Savior is. You're a child of God. You're a Christian that you have to think differently now as a Christian. So that all the time we are constantly, no matter how long you've been a Christian, we are learning to lean, as the old chorus says, learning to lean on Jesus. So whatever your situation this morning, and our situations are very varied, and there are some great difficulties uh, amongst us as, a, as, as God's people here, Whatever your situation this morning, however difficult it may be, this is really relevant to you, isn't it? If you're not a Christian, then the most urgent thing is for you to trust in Christ. Is to, is to, is to trust in the Lord Jesus with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and, and he has promised he will direct your paths. But for those of us who are already Christians... Here is a reminder to us, too, that we are called in our daily lives to go on trusting him. You know, when you look back, you realize he, he never has failed you, has he? And he's given you so many great and precious promises. And I love those words. One of the great promises that I, I, I particularly love is Psalm 84, verse 11 and 12. Psalm 84. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. As somebody once said, you can take your unbelief and you can smash it to pieces on the rock of ages. There is compassion. There is unbelief here as he tests his own disciples with a question. But thirdly, there is power. See, so having heard their unbelief, Jesus says to the, he tells the disciples, make the people sit down. Now, in this instance, it's, it's useful to know, in verse 10, when Jesus says, make the people sit down, the word that he uses is translated really as to lay down. It's, it's not just to sit, but it's to recline, to sit back, to lean back. John tells us in verse 10, in addition, not only does Jesus tell his disciples to tell the people to lay down, but John tells us there was much grass, verse 10, in that place. So the people are to lie down in a place where there is much grass. You know, from the summer onwards, the landscape in Galilee is brown. It's scorched by the sun. But... Um, 
after the winter rains, if you go sort of April, May, it's the best time to go to Israel. If anyone wants to, if anyone's interested in going, have a word with me. Um, but uh, April, May time, it's lush and it's green and Galilee is just beautiful uh, in those months because it's so lush and green. But you know, we're told that this is the, the Passover time. So it, it's in the spring. Galilee is lovely and green. And there is detail. In fact, Mark, surprisingly, who is normally really brief and very short in his descriptions, but Mark actually tells us in his uh, rendering of this, his, his recording of this miracle, he says that Jesus makes them sit down in the green grass. He specifies. So if you put all of this together, Jesus says, make them lie down. We're told that there was much grass. Mark says there was green grass. Haven't you heard that somewhere before? Psalm 23, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Are we not being told here that Jesus is the good shepherd? He makes us lie down in green pastures. And as the good shepherd, he feeds us. He gives thanks. And then he begins to distribute the bread and the fish to the people who are reclining in the green grass. In fact, there is so much food, we're told that they eat they eat plentifully, they eat as much as they wanted, we're told. As much as they, want, as they wanted. Over and above what they needed to satisfy their hunger. The amount that's left over, they fill 12 basketfuls. Now, folks, the, we're not talking about little bread baskets that you will have maybe on your lunch table today. We're talk, these are fishermen, these are fishing baskets. Huge, 12 baskets full. In other words, the whole thing speaks of an abundance that is left over. You know, you have to smile when you read what some of the old liberal scholars uh, wrote and they, how they explain away the miracles of Christ. Do you know how the liberal scholars, even today, would explain away this miracle? They say, well, of course, what is happening here is that all the people see this little boy and they're, they're, maybe they are ashamed by the generosity of this little boy who is willing to part with his five loaves and two fish. They're deeply challenged and so what they do is they all share what little they have. Maybe just take a crumb and then they pass it on and in that way, of course, 5,000, they wouldn't say 25,000, but 5,000 are fed. We're just not, not, they're not satisfied, but they're given just a, a, a crumb. It's, so, so, in fact, the miracle then becomes a, a, a lesson in generosity. It becomes a moral lesson about generosity. But, friends, are we really expected to believe that that's an explanation of how Jesus feeds thousands of people? And, hang on, what about the 12 basketfuls that were left over? The truth is exactly as you read it here in your Bible. It is a miracle because this is Jesus, the one who is Lord of all, and if he chooses to, to feed 5,000, let alone 25,000, he can do so because he's the God-man. Because this is Jesus who John told us about at the very beginning of chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without nothing was made that was made. So this miracle is not some moral lesson about sharing your food with those in need. It is a grand demonstration of the power of God, who can call into existence things that did not even exist. Jesus has the power to suddenly create an abundance of food that did not exist before. And if he has the power to do that, then he has the power to raise the dead. And we see that too. On three occasions, he raises three people who are dead. It means that if he can call into existence things that did not exist, then he can raise the dead if he so chooses to do so. Those, and certainly raise those who are dead in trespasses and sins. And he can create new creatures from those who are spiritually, whose hearts are spiritually dead. 
You know, in the past week, I was reading about the uh, three miracles where Jesus raises the dead. Uh, do you remember? Each one was different. Jairus' daughter, remember? Uh, Jairus, he uh, sent for the Lord Jesus, who was interrupted, you remember? He, and Jesus had his purposes for stalling that. Uh, there was a woman with the issue of blood who laid hold of the hem of his garment, uh, representing righteousness. Jairus' daughter, she died. But when Jesus got there, she was dead, but she was still warm. Then the son of the widow of Nain died. Remember, there's Jesus meets, comes to a head-on collision with a funeral procession coming out of the village of Nain. And we're told that the young man, this woman's son, was uh, in a coffin. And Jesus touched, unthinkably touched the coffin, and he lived. And so his, he was that young man, he was dead, but he was cold. And then there was a third person called Lazarus. We'll come to him a little bit later in a few weeks' time. John chapter 11, when Jesus came to the tomb, he'd been dead for four days already. So three people that Jesus raises from the dead. One who was dead and warm, one who was dead and cold, and a third one who was dead and he stank. Every unbeliever is spiritually dead. They have no power. If you're not a Christian, you have no power in yourself to change your heart. Only God can do it. And that is true of every non-Christian. But you know, there is a difference. There are some unbelievers that you meet, and they're spiritually dead, but they're kind of warm. You meet some unbelievers, and they're spiritually dead, but they're cold and indifferent. And there are some unbelievers you meet, and they're spiritually dead, and they stink. Do you know, I remember a godly old minister in Mid Wales from a farming background. I think one of the most tender hearted and gracious men I think I've ever met. A man who just kind of oozed kindness and, and grace. Most gracious man who's with the Lord now. Lovely, lovely man. And I remember him once saying to me, he said, and this is a very gracious man, but I remember him saying to me, he said, Do you know, he said, there are times, sometimes he said, I meet. I, when I, I'm talking to a, a, a non-Christian, he said, there are times, he said, if I'm talking to a man who is utterly godless, he said, I can smell him. Now, I don't know what you make of that. I'm not sure that he meant it literally. But I understand what he means. But you see, the good news is this, that here, here we see the power of Christ, the power of of God, so that no matter how dead someone is spiritually, Jesus has the power to give them life and to raise them to new life and to satisfy their every need. See, we need to remember this. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to us, when we receive the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it's not like you get a little bit of Jesus. You get the whole person. You get the whole Christ. You get all the fullness of God in Christ when you trust in him. He meets your needs in abundance. Friends, let's give up our small ideas, our shallow views of all that we have in Christ. We have all things and abound, the apostle writes. Plenteous grace with him is found. Grace to cover all my sins. Let the healing streams abound. Make and keep me pure within all this you have in Jesus. You know, I remember when I started in, before I started in ministry in Bible college as a really young Christian, an old man, an ex-miner in South Wales who, used to, who was a, a good preacher. Uh, and I remember him saying to me, he said, he said, when you preach, he said, preach sin like it is sin and preach Christ as the great Savior that he is. That's what you need to remember. There is power here. Fourthly, there is fulfillment here. Now, I said at the beginning that the, this is the only miracle which is recorded in all four of the Gospels. And I think the reason for that, I think that there is something here in this miracle that, that we, we maybe don't see in the other miracles. 
In all the other miracles, we're reminded of the power of Christ as the Son of God. But in this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, we see so clearly that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise that Moses was pointing towards. Moses was the shadow. Jesus is the substance, the reality. There are so many reminders. If you look for them, you'll find so many So many reminders here of Moses and the Exodus, some of which are subtle, some of which are are obvious. For example, look at uh, how chapter chapter 5 ends, verses 45 to 47. See, verses 45 to 47, he says to the Jewish leaders who dispute with him, who take issue with the Lord Jesus for... uh, for what he does, for his healing. And uh, he says to them, what about Moses? He said, if you really believe Moses, you experts in the law of Moses, if you really believe Moses, you believe me, for he wrote about me, says Jesus. Verse 47, chapter 5, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus says to the Jewish leaders, all that Moses wrote and all that he did was pointing towards him. And you find reminders again and again. You find reminders of this here in this miracle. So that, for example, in uh, chapter 6, in in our chapter here, verse 3, where was Jesus when he teaches the crowds? We're told, verse 3, and Jesus went up on the mountain. Don't you remember somebody else that went up on a mountain? There are no high mountains around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, there are hills, there's the Horns of Hattin, which I suppose are quite high, but it's basically a really high hill. There are no mountains around uh, the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. We're told that Jesus went up on the mountain, so did Moses. When does the miracle take place? Verse 4, it was near the time of Passover. The Passover, still celebrated by Jews today, celebrates their deliverance out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses, who took them to the Promised Land. What happens? Well, when they're traveling through the wilderness in the Exodus, God is moved with compassion, you remember, for the people. Even though they're unbelieving and undeserving, he still feeds them with bread, bread from heaven called manna. And he gives them water from the rock. In fact, later in the next chapter, actually, chapter 7, Jesus is going to say to them, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Jesus says that out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Just, again, another allusion back to the the exodus. And then what about the 12 basketfuls left over? Well, you could say, well, it's just recording detail. Sometimes scripture in, in the Bible, there are details. We're not to sort of read significance into every number and every single detail. But I think in this context, it is significant as there are so many allusions back to the Exodus and to Moses. Now, Jesus is the greater than Moses. He is the fulfillment. He is the prophet that they were to look for, that God would raise up. Deuteronomy chapter 18. In this instance, the 12 basketfuls are significant. Do you remember, in the wilderness, God grouped his people into the 12 tribes and fed them abundantly. And now he is able to care for his people. And shepherd them. And there are 12 basketfuls left over. And what about even this reference to testing? Philip, that's why I said we'd come back to this. Even this reference to testing Philip reminds us of the way that he tested his people in the wilderness, in Exodus, to see what was in their hearts, whether they would trust him or not. And just like Israel, Philip fails the test just like Israel did, and yet God feeds them anyway because he's gracious and compassionate, long-suffering and abounding with mercy and love. All these allusions, references to the Exodus, reminding us that Jesus is the one who is greater than Moses, who has come in fulfillment of all the promises, and it means salvation for all those who believe in him. We ourselves were once in captivity, weren't we? Captivity, slaves of sin, with a sentence of death hanging over us. Jesus has set us free. 
He has delivered us from the realm of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And he's done that by the shed blood that was sprinkled across the lintel and down the, the doorposts. And by the blood of the Lamb, he's delivered us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his own dear Son, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins, in order that we might proclaim the praises of him who call us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And now he says, and I will shepherd you. I will lead you to fountains of living waters. So that he makes even the, the desert to be a place of blessing. Loves us freely. I will bless you. He will lavish his love and grace upon us in abundance. So that he is, he is worthy of our trust. And faithful obedience, service, and daily worship. And the offering of ourselves as living sacrifices. Because we see the fulfillment here. But lastly, fi finally, you see in the fifth place, the response, verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this truly is the prophet. It's a fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. I will raise up for you a prophet like Moses, only much greater than Moses. This truly is the prophet who has come into the world. Some of these people knew their scriptures well. They could see the connection. They knew that here's the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them what I, all that I command him. But the problem is, you see, is that these people, the crowds that come to Jesus for bread, they, they don't understand the kind of salvation that he has come to bring. They're hoping that he's going to deliver them from earthly oppressors from Herod and from uh, the, the Romans. He's, they're, they're hoping that this Jesus is going to bring in an earthly paradise, <clears throat> which is why immediately following this, you notice in verse 15, directly, so that we don't miss the connection, immediately after this miracle, in verse 15, therefore when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Jesus has just fed them abundantly, provided food for their stomachs. And the problem is, it's the only thing they care about. It was no different in the Exodus, was it? God provided for them. And the slightest inconvenience, and they were harking back. Do you remember how much better it was in Egypt? Are they, did they forget about the slavery and the brutality of Egypt? It was so much better back in Egypt with the leeks and the onions and the cucumber and the garlic and the melons. And, and we're told in the Psalms that when they complained against God and when they cried out for food for their stomachs, we're told that God gave them, gave them what they wanted. He, he, he gave them their desires but sent leanness to their souls. And the only thing that they want is food for their stomachs, bread for their stomachs because they don't understand that they're to live not by, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. They think their problems are material problems, which is why they turn to idolatry. Even, even, even before Moses gets down from the top of the mountain, they're already worshipping a golden calf. The you know, human heart does not change. Our hearts are the same today as ever. That's why the Bible is the most relevant book in the whole world, because it speaks to the human condition, which does not change. What is it that we want most from God? Is it righteousness and deliverance from sin or just earthly security? How do you respond? How will you respond to this miracle, this sign? We see the compassion of Jesus, the unbelief of the disciples, the power of God, the fulfillment of God's promise, and the response of the people. And we see later in this chapter when Jesus begins preaching to their hearts and offering them deliverance from sin, many of the people walk away because they don't want the real Jesus who calls us to repentance and faith in Christ. And Jesus says to them in verse 27 of this very chapter, do not labor for food that perishes. But they don't want to know. 
But, but, praise God, on the other hand, there are disciples like Peter. Jesus turns and asks them, verse 67 and 68 at the end of this chapter, what about you? Are you... But when many of the disciples, so-called disciples, that were only following him because of the bread that they got for their stomachs, when they began to walk away, when they didn't like the hard spiritual things that Jesus was saying, like do not labor for food that perishes, when they began to walk away, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, well, what about you? Are you also going to go away? You know, every time I say that, I know that somebody will at some point because I've seen it consistently, and you have too those who once professed faith in Christ, but they're nowhere now. What about you? See, this is not just hypothetical, is it? What about you? Will you also walk away from me? And Peter replies, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. One way or another, I almost started singing about that. <laughs> Tells you something about my background. W- one way or another, you've made your decision about Jesus. Every single one of us this morning will cast our votes for Jesus or against Jesus. One way or another, you will leave this building this morning having cast your vote one way or another either for Christ or against him. There are no abstentions. I often say that an abstention is a no vote. Will you also walk away this morning? Or will you say, Lord Jesus, we really have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord, who else do I go to? You have the words of eternal life.